The Red Web, Chapter 14 Comrades Blythe laughed, loud, louder perhaps than necessary, wanting to show his enjoyment of the Orlok's joke. He backed off a little, also not wanting to draw too much attention to the conversation, as the bars were being monitored more and more by informants. He'd met the fellow Jules earlier that night, and like most nights, was spending his evening gently spreading the message of the manifesto, though not by name. Their conversation had crossed many topics, from modifying racing bikes to running goods through the ash wastes and even combat tactics for dealing with the local Escher gang. In the months since he'd snuck into Roshan, Blythe had taken to working on a smelting line, putting him close in contact with the Orlocks bringing slag and salvage to melt down. Getting to his fellow workers had been relatively easy. Their work was miserable, and the us-versus-them narrative played really well with their existing worldview. Convincing the Orlocks was harder. They were suspicious of other houses, and they often looked down on the Goliaths in particular as lacking intellect. But Blythe was the exception. His wit and his ability to hold a conversation ingratiated him with the Orlocks and allowed him an opportunity to recruit and to spread their ideas. You have to understand, we're doing a job, it's just a bit slower, it's not quitting, they can't get anywhere punishing us for it, because they need the tithe more the longer we slow things down. You're crazy, mate. They may let it slide now when everything is failing and going to shit, but as soon as things stabilize, they'll make you pay. I don't want that on my head. Do you know how brutal Lady Illyria can be? I'm not crossing her, man. Rav, you gotta remember, we're doing this to get rid of them. Reset the order of things to run better. Another world is possible. We need only reach out and seize it. You're crazy, man. I must be too, because I'm considering it. Jules took two shots and swayed with intoxication. The bar was busy, as were most watering holes in the steel district, after a day of working in front of hot furnaces. Blythe knew almost every person in the bar, but his eyes flicked between the handful of patrons he didn't recognize. The work he was doing here could turn ugly quick if he got unlucky. He'd had to beat a crew of amateur bounty hunters to death a few weeks earlier because they'd discovered him explaining the concept of exploitation to a serf in a steel town bar. Still, tonight had been quiet, he thought, so best not to invite disaster by thinking about it too much. The next night, he found himself in another bar on the other side of town, this time having some polite but threatening banter with a few eshers about who was allowed to drink at the bar. He asked them about their work, listened as they vented, unaccustomed to a Goliath who didn't immediately resort to violence when challenged. Within a few hours, they were doing shots of old Olandis and making jokes. As Blythe explained the basic dynamic of divide and conquer, and how the clan house system kept everyone in a state of perpetual war that prevented them from challenging the nobles directly, another patron stepped over to his table and asked to speak with him. The Orlock in front of him introduced himself as the Lord of the Ash Tillers, a scavenger road crew. Blythe recognized the logo on his jacket as the same as the Orlock jewels that he'd been talking to the night before. Listen, mate, I heard you was in our bar last night talking bullshit, and now you're getting forces up our ass. My man Jules is in the lockup right now because of you. I'm here to tell you that if I see you in here again, you're dead. Full stop. Blythe's eyes narrowed. He didn't like it when gang leaders tried to throw their weight around with him. He said you're bit... Now it's your turn to listen. I'm going to drink where I please, talk to who I please, and make as many friends as I want. If you think you're going to kill me over it, take your shot right now. Full stop. The Orlock boss didn't seem confident about taking Blythe one-on-one, but he also just got challenged in full view of a rival Escher gang, so he didn't have much choice. Going for a knife on his hip, he slashed across the larger man's arm. Blythe grunted as rivulets of blood rose up along the gash. He swung his fist down, connecting, and knocking the poor sap out in a single hit. Coming to a minute later, Blythe helped the man up. Listen. There's no reason for us to be enemies. I've come here to help put this pointless infighting behind us. This hive is ready. We just need to push. The structures keeping us and others at each other's throats fall. Dazed, he accepted a drink and sat, recovering from the shock and pain and feeling the lump on his head. The barkeep was stitching Blythe's arm up. The ushers and the orlock started making jokes, and Blythe smiled. 
It's one thing to say another world is possible, but it's another to witness it. The bar suddenly grew silent. Three enforcers out of uniform had just walked into the place. Walking up to the bar, they ordered drinks, and Blythe noticed them scanning across the room, with one's eyes stuck on him in an unintentional stare. He gently slid a hand down to his hip holster and unfastened it, preparing to draw his weapon if things got reddish. The bartender nodded to the men and walked over. Uh, listen, mate, uh, I don't know the story with these guys, but they drink here from time to time, and they've always treated the place nice. They said they want to talk about some of your ideas. I can't vouch for them, but I'm making the introduction in the hope to keep the peace. Blythe gestured for them to come over and have a seat. What do you want, copper? The officer sitting next to him smiled and said, It just so happens we've been doing some reading. Some materials confiscated in a raid. Seems there's a real opportunity here to make some changes in Hive leadership. We're sick of being worked to the bone. We're treated as disposable. We're forced to spend our time cleaning up after the bullshit the merchant guilds and the nobles cause. We want in. There must be a place for us. We want to help change things. Blythe smirked. Listen, you don't talk a good game, I'm sure. You got a lot of nerve even asking, knowing full well we're all going to think you're infiltrators. But unfortunately, no matter how good your intentions, I can't know whether you're lying or not, and the movement comes first, so piss off. I understand, said the other, but there are more of us, well-armed, and we know the streets better than anyone, know the tactical layouts for holding just about every part of the hive, and they're all mapped out. We've got all the data drives. We could help you. You'd be willing to hand over that to us. It would buy you an awful lot of goodwill. No enforcer, no matter how good the informant, would hand over such crucial, pertinent data. Make a plan to drop it and we'll be there. We know what's coming. We want to be on the right side. We want to build a better Roshan. Well, true or not, I can't turn it on and off like that. And so they set about arranging a meeting. Blythe knew he could be signing his death warrant, but the enforcers were the meanest gang in the hive. If he could undermine them, this plan might actually succeed after all. Thoughts flooded his mind of the disruption that was possible with the enforcers fighting themselves. He grinned. This might actually work. They could take the hive with minimal casualties, minimal time, minimal damage, and they could be running it properly before there was even an opportunity for Helmar to respond. He only hoped that the other hives in the cluster were proving as ample of ground for the revolution. Their only chance was to succeed together, to prove such a threat to Lord Helmar's ability to meet his obligations that he must accept their leadership. This was a dangerous play, a desperate play, but it was the time to make it.